I'm appreciative to Brother Jonathan and for the theme that he selected for Christian Service Day 2021, the theme being back to service and specifically uh, the theme or the topic rather for this second session, the discipline to serve and to come speak to us uh, this hour is our brother Glenn Colley. Brother Colley is no stranger uh, to East Hill. Um, he speaks on uh, many events here and many events throughout the Brotherhood. He is the minister at the West Huntsville Church of Christ. We're certainly appreciative of him and all the good work that he does, and we're grateful uh, that he's here today to speak boldly to us on the discipline to serve. Brother Colley. Thank you, Caleb. I could tell you that it is an honor for me to get to come and be part of this today, but that would just be inadequate. I, I mean, it is an honor to get to come, and I'm just so grateful for Jonathan inviting me to come this year. I've come a number of years, always enjoy it. Good to hear Brother Mosier, and always great to be around him, and he's my friend. And, but when I am standing here, I'm enveloped with uh, memories. I, 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 I I could spend the entire time today not preaching, but just reminiscing. Uh, uh, this uh, Madison Street out here, Cindy and I, when we, we didn't have any children, when we lived in the house over here that belonged to the church, and we would take our walks, you know, and before long, why, we would take those walks pushing a baby stroller. And, and then before long, we would push a baby stroller, and then one of us would pull a child in a wagon. And, and I, uh, I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you for all that this great church has meant in our lives and continues to mean, and all of the wonderful, wonderful memories. And life gets by so very quickly, doesn't it? So very quickly. And that's all right. It's the way the Lord designed it. I just want you to know that I'm anticipating uh, being in glory with you. And I'm, I'm eager for that. I, I love living here. I love my life. I've, God's blessed us so very richly. But won't it be wonderful over there? Won't it be? I have so many people I want to see. I want to sit down and talk with. And I'm anticipating that, looking forward to that. All right. Let's talk about the discipline of service. I just can't wait to talk about this because the study has meant so much to me in preparation. I want you to open your Bibles to John chapter 13. If you want an outline of my lesson, you can have it by leaving that passage open on your lap. Now, I want to do several things, actually four, to prep for John 13. We're going to do the first, do the first 17 verses, but I, I just think it's going to be half-baked unless we first do some preliminary matters. So I've got four of them I want to talk about. Now, you know what discipline means. It means what you think. It means it means training to prepare for some ethic or some way of doing things. And so this is a good subject. And, and Jesus is our trainer. We're his disciples. We're his students. So let's talk about the discipline of training for service. The first thing we need to talk about as we prepare for John 13 is, is the humility of Jesus. I love to think about the me metaphors that our Lord would use. He would say in John chapter 6, I'm the bread of life. If you, if you follow me, you'll never hunger. And then John chapter 8, and he said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't walk in darkness. I like that. John chapter 10, I am the door. But when you get to Matthew chapter 11 and 28, now you get real personal. And you're familiar with this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now listen to this. I'm meek, I'm lowly in heart. You'll find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now this is the description Jesus attached to himself. I'm meek and lowly in heart. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about, and you could too, I guess, about meek and lowly. I don't have time for that, but just to, just to summarize it, it would be this. Some translations say I'm gentle, gentle and lowly in heart. And lowly is a striking word. Why would the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, attach that word to himself? Why would that be the descriptive term? I'm lowly. It means to go low. It means to be low. It means to, one of the definitions when you look it up in the Greek is insignificant. 
That doesn't mean the Lord was insignificant. It means that, that he postured himself in such a way to serve, as Brother Moser's been talking about, to, to be lowly. I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. I'm lowly in heart. Number two, the teaching of Jesus. I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 20. I doubt that you really get our text today, which is John chapter 13. I, I, re I really think you need Matthew 20 to prepare for it. So we're in verse 20. Here's what it says, Matthew 20 and verse 20. When the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him, and he said to her, what do you wish? She, she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. See, they had a wrong idea about the kingdom. They, they pictured Jesus overturning the Roman government and it was going to be an earthly kingdom and he would have some fabulous throne and they had some grandiose ideas. They, they didn't really understand about the church and Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? You know, what he was talking about was the cross. They said to him, we're able. They don't get it. We're, we're able. He said to them, you shall indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom is, it is prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They have authority. They're in authority. And those who are great exercise authority over them because they're greater. You have a pecking order. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, a ransom for many. I want you to focus on that last part there. He came to give his life a ransom for many. That brings us to the third thing. What's the, what was the mission of Jesus? I had an assignment recently to write an article for a spiritual sword. And it's a great publication. and It was the mission of the church. Brother Van, a while ago, when he was leading us in prayer, referenced the mission of the church. That's kind of an interesting thing, and I mean, you know, we, 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 we hear, hear this terminology, but you know, it's not in the Scripture. I mean, not verbatim that way. There's no place in the New Testament where you have that phrase, the mission of the church. How would you write an article about the mission of the church? And the answer is, well, you, you just have to appreciate the relationship the church has to Jesus. What are we to Jesus? Well, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, God gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. What are we? Christians, we're, we're the body of Christ. Now, just, just consider the significance of that. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, we're the bride of Christ. Think of the significance of that. We're attached to him. We are his representatives, if you please. On this earth, that's who we are. The church doesn't really have a mission. The mission of Christ has a church. We, we're, we're His. We're an extension of who He is. When I wrote the article, I just, I, I just went through and found cases in the New Testament where Jesus would say, I came to do this, or similar terminology. You ought to try that sometimes. It's a fascinating study. You have just a few of them, but enough that you, you get, get this feeling for what his mission is. And then that's what our mission is. It's as simple as that. Luke 19, 10, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. I expect that's the pinnacle right there. What is our mission? Our mission is to emulate Christ. Our mission, you, you say, I need the discipline of service. I need to get that. How do you get that? And the answer is, you start with understanding our relationship to Jesus Christ and the mission, our mission, and, and that he's lowly in heart. How do you like that? 
king of kings and lord of lords, and he's lowly in heart. That's the description he would make of himself. All right, the fourth thing that I want to give to prep us for John 13 is, is this idea of foot washing. Now, I brought a quote from D.A. Carson because I think it does it well. You already have some perspective of foot washing, and anyway, he says this, they could not conceive of washing one another's feet since this was a task normally reserved for the lowliest of menial servants. Peers did not wash one another's feet, except very rarely and as a mark of great love. Some Jews insisted that Jewish slaves could not be required to wash the feet of others. This job should be reserved for Gentile slaves or for women and children and pupils. In one well-known story, when Rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael returned home from a synagogue one day and his mother wished to wash his feet, he refused on the ground that the task was too demeaning. She took the matter to court on the ground among the rabbis that she viewed the task, in this case, as an honor. The reluctance of Jesus' disciples to volunteer for such a task is, to say the least, culturally understandable. Their shock at his volunteering is not merely the result of being shamefaced. It is their response to finding their sense of the fitness of things shattered. Now that prepares us for our text. John chapter 13. I want to start in the first verse. We're going to be discussing the first 17 verses. Now, the, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, I want you to get the moment. I want you to, I want you to put yourself in that moment of time, and you got to do this to get the lesson. He was going to depart. He was ready to depart out of this world. Now, you and I are governed, I think, every day by trivia. I don't like that. I think that trivia pushes us, things that are not so terribly significant in the great scheme of things, but are, I don't know, important in the moment. But I doubt when you come to the time that you're about to die that trivia will be occupying your mind very much, especially if you still have your faculties completely like Jesus did, someone who's about to be executed. It's a very short amount of time, and he's going to leave this world. I'm telling you that he's not governed by trivia. He's going to depart this world. I only say that to say that this hones our attention because, because Jesus must surely choose what he will do in these last hours of his life. He's going to depart out of this world. Isn't that interesting terminology? Same like, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm now ready to depart. You know, my, the time of my departure is at hand. He should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Talking about his disciples. He loved them to the end. It literally means into the final goal. He had loved them to completion to the fullest. He loved them. Now I want you to look in his eyes on the screen of your imagination. And look at, see, see what you see. I'm telling you, it's almost time for the cross. What do you see? He's, he's contemplating what's about to happen. How many crucifixions did Jesus see before he, his own? How, how often had he seen the Romans crucify people? Got to think about that. Crucifixion wasn't merely an execution. It was, it was a humiliation. It was, it was to shoot a bow over the ship, to everybody else. You want to defy the Romans? You want to defy us? Go ahead and try. Look at what will happen. See, it's a warning to everybody around. It's subjugation is what it is. It wasn't just execution. It was execution at a very high level. They would strip a man and they would humiliate him. They would put him under intense agony after beating him and they'd nail him to a tree and then they would mock him while he struggled to breathe. It, was, it wasn't just execution. It was inhumane. It was for the purpose of subjugation. Look into his eyes as he's going to, to say these things. It says he's about to depart and he loves them to the end. He loves them. 
I want you to think about what he knew about Judas. Jesus knew. This is very striking to me. Luke indicates in Luke 22 that Judas had already sold the Lord. He'd already negotiated the deal with the Jewish leaders. And so I, I don't know, maybe he had the 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. When, when you, you have this discussion in the upper room, it's Thursday before the crucifixion and it's the Passover. And, and there's a lot of activity in Jerusalem. It's not like normal, you know, because so many people have poured in for Passover, thick with people. There's the rustling of the crowd. There's the the stench of the blood on the, the garments of the priests. It's about springtime and it's Passover, thick with people. And Jesus wanted to eat the Passover with his disciples and he asked them to go to this upper room and secure it. And you know how that worked out. But as he sits here, you say, well, what's he going to talk about? What will he talk about? He's thinking about the cross. He's thinking about Judas sitting there. Of course he knows. Of course he knows. I mean, and it very well could be that Judas has those 30 pieces of silver in his pocket right now. Have you ever considered that, that Jesus at this moment has a way of escape? I mean, we think about Matthew 26, 53. Peter, put your sword up there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Put your sword up. I, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels? I could, I could call them. I don't have to do this. I can reverse this anytime I want, and in a magnificent way, 12 legions of angels. I don't, I don't need your sword. Put it up. But that's not the only time Jesus had this way of escape, and perhaps you could think of others. But I would say that when he sits down in the upper room with his disciples, and he, and he says, one of you is going to betray me, which, betray you? What do you mean? Which one? Who? Who, Lord? Is it I, Lord? The one with whom I dip my hand in the dish but it's so discreetly covered that they don't recognize it. They don't know. They, they don't pick up on this. Do you suppose that, that the, the apostles wouldn't have stopped this had they known that it was Judas? I'm just saying that here's another example, another point at which Jesus could have reversed the whole matter, at least to, to make an attempt of escape. All he had to say is, it's Judas. Judas is the one. He's already betrayed me. He's already sold me. He's going to... Gonna, show the, the enemies where I am so they can take me away and crucify me. It's Judas. It's Judas. What would have happened? Bear in mind that Peter's wearing a sword, right? Peter's armed with a lethal weapon. They'd, they'd, have, they'd have jumped on Judas. Why didn't Jesus just say it? Look in his eyes. He's, he's thinking about the cross. He's thinking about Judas. Judas. Betrayal is bitter, particularly if it's somebody you, you have loved, somebody that's a friend. Somebody, you, you ever been betrayed? Somebody, a family member maybe, to whom you've made yourself vulnerable and then they betray you. The bitterness is awful and, and surely Jesus is feeling that. Look in his eyes, look in his eyes. In this moment when he could, he could run, he could bolt, but he doesn't. And so verse 4 says this. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took it. I, I'm going to read these two verses, but as I do, there are six details. Now, it, it's, it's almost laborious. That's not the right word, but it's very precise. The details are presented in a very precise manner. Surely it's because he wants us to be painting a mental picture. I want you to put yourself there. I want you to see what's happening. Now, the reason's not so difficult. In verse 15, he's going to say that I'm giving you an example. He's illustrating something for your life and my life about service. And, and he's about to launch this. And, and so the Holy Spirit gives this in great detail. I, I count six details. He rose from supper. Parenthetically, uh, the original language, and this is reflected in some other translations. I think the ASV does it this way. But it wasn't that, that supper was finished. It was while supper was going on. And so apparently, you know, Jesus has some food. He eats some, but he can't, he can't not go ahead with this. Supper's not really important to him. So he rose from supper. He laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. 
He looks an awful lot like a servant now, like a slave. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, you, you know something about this background. In, in a typical household, this was so very common. You, if you were having people over, you'd position some servant, some child, somebody at the door who would have a basin of water and a pitcher and a towel, and they wore sandals. If you go to Jerusalem today, sandals like this are for sale everywhere because it's reminiscent of what people wore. In, in John 1 and 27, reference is made to the fact that Jesus wore them. But what happens with the dusty streets of Galilee, what happens with the grime is that it's an abrasive between your toes and it's uncomfortable. And so this was just a courtesy, but it was also very common. It's just what people did. If you were a guest, you got your feet washed and somebody lowly would wash them and water in a rag and dry them off. And, and it must have been uh, very pleasant to have that when you came in. And that's what Jesus did. He began to wipe them with the towel. And then there was an objection. I want to go to verse 6 now. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And that, you know, so, so Jesus is not rebuking him at this moment. But I kind of think that what happened is that Jesus washes various other disciples feet then it comes to Peter and Peter says are you gonna wash mine I think he pulled his feet back I don't know that I assume he pulled his feet back under the chair or, or, or beside where, 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 you, I don't want you to you can't do that I don't think this is right and Jesus very gently says what, what I'm doing you don't understand right now but you will understand I think that's very gentle but Peter's you know how Peter is Ever since I was a kid, we, we used the word impetuous. I think it's kind of funny that, that we've attached that word to him. It's not really in Scripture, but that's the word that we think of. He's impetuous. That's it's really true. Peter said to him, verse 8, You shall never wash my feet. Never, never, never. This cannot happen. Now, why did he say that? I, th I think what he's trying to show is humility before Jesus. I, I can't allow you to do this. You're, you can't serve me. You're the king of kings and you're my master and I'm not going to let you. You will never do this. And Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. That, that takes my breath. I, I don't, it, was a, it was a gentle rebuke. I think, I think that Jesus didn't have time to quibble with Peter. You know, Peter has this thing about him this impetuous thing that he does, and he's doing it now. And it's kind of funny that, that his, it looks like humility. It, really, it was pride. It was pride covered with humility. At the root was pride. He, he should let Jesus do what Jesus wants to do. And he's interfering. He's interrupting Jesus' train of thought here. It's, it's also, and I don't know if I'm making too much out of this, but I think it's interesting that this is about washing feet, but Jesus didn't say, if I do not wash your feet, then you have no part of me. He said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. I suppose that has reference to the bigger picture. Maybe we're, we're, we're less than two months away from, from the beginning of the church, right? So you have, this is the Passover feast, and then Pentecost is 50 days, hence, less than two months Jesus is going to die on that cross. His disciples, are, these apostles are his ambassadors. And this Peter is going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 are going to obey the gospel. So this is about to happen. Anyway, Jesus says, if I don't wash you, I suppose that probably has reference to Revelation 1.5. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That tells us what washes away our sins. You must always remember this. Always remember what washes away our sins is the blood of Jesus. You say, I don't understand that. How, how can I reach back a couple of thousand years and appropriate the blood of the cross to my own sins? How is that possible? And the answer is Acts 22 and 16. And now, why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized. Ready? And wash away thy sins. It's when I'm baptized. I do not know. Jesus, in responding, says, not just if I don't wash your feet, but if I do not wash you, you have no part of me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. 
Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. I assume he's referencing them, but it's completely clean. And you're clean, but not all of you. And then John's editorial comment here, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. I, I, suppose, I suppose it would be good parenthetically here to mention the fact that some churches have seen fit, as you know, to, to do this, um, keep foot, feet washing as an ordinance, a right in their religious practices. And of course, that just completely misses the whole point. It doesn't enhance what's going on here. It diminishes from it. Jesus wasn't teaching something that should be done perpetually uh, in, in reference to feet washing. He was teaching a grander, a bigger lesson than that. This was an illustration and, and not about, well, are you aware of the fact that you have this in John chapter 13, the washing of feet, and, and then you, you're not going to see it again until you get, you know where? Can you think of the other instance in the New Testament where you have the washing of feet? It's not about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. It's not tied to that. And in Acts 2 and 42, they continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers, not mentioned there. You know where it's mentioned? 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 10 about widows. And it's about service, that the widows, you know, a widow indeed is one who has washed the disciples' feet. It wasn't something to be done included in our worship. It wasn't for that purpose. It was merely an illustration of service. And so it, it works perfectly, perfectly well with that. Guy in Woods, in his commentary on John, will say that it will be the fourth century before people will start doing this as a religious practice. All right. Everything that I've said up until this point has been to prepare us for what we're about to do right now. I, I don't have my clicker. Do I? Oh, I do. Very good. Okay. Let's see here now. Here we go. Oh, well, now we, there. One, now then. All right. Let's start in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet taken his garments, sat down again. He said to them, do you know what I've done to you? Now, don't you think that's funny? I mean, do you know what I've done to you? Well, well I mean, that's not complicated. He washed their feet. Ah, but see, you know, that's not, it's not about the washing of the feet. It's an object lesson. It's something much bigger than that. I'm teaching you something. Do you understand that I'm teaching you something? They did not know what that meant. They did not know what the object lesson was, but here it is. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example, an illustration, that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Let me tell you something. You and I have just been trained in the discipline of serving. Who are you? You say, I'm a Christian, right? What does that mean? It means I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? I am part of the bride of Christ, right? I'm part of the body of Christ, right? What does that reference or mean in reference to serving? It means that I serve a Savior who washed the disciples' feet at the Passover just before he died. And he said, this is an example. I'm giving you an example. And if I, your master and your Lord, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. All right, six things. I want to give you six, six lessons we derive, derive from this amazing passage. Here we go. Number one, my service must be expressed to people based on their need and not on their name. This is something we learned in other places too. You know, in Luke chapter 10, for example, you have the parable of the Good Samaritan. Isn't that about much the same thing? Why would you stop and help him? The Samaritan or a Jew rather, I mean, now you're a Samaritan. You have the, the priest of the Levite and the Samaritan, and why would he stop and help him? Remember that, that parable was told in response to a lawyer who asked 
Jesus the question, and who is my neighbor? Willing to justify himself, who is my neighbor? And Jesus taught this, this parable. In James chapter 2, you have two men come into the assembly, and one of them is rich and impressive and has gold, and the other one is a poor man. And you say to the poor man, just sit over here in the corner on the floor, sit on the floor. To the rich man, you say, come and sit in this impressive place. And Jesus says, stop it. Just stop it. I think it's interesting that he didn't ask the 12 to wash his feet, but to wash someone else's feet. I think it would be wonderful to wash the feet of Jesus. Wouldn't you stand in line to wash the feet of Jesus? But that wasn't the point. Could I, could I wash the feet of people that I don't always necessarily like? I wonder, after the crucifixion, how long it was before one of those disciples turned to the other one and said, wait a minute, he washed Judas' feet, and he already knew what Judas had done and what he was going to do, and he washed his feet. There's a lesson here, Christians, and that is that my service must be expressed to people based on their need and, and not on their name. And here's the second one. My attitude of service must be based on the inverted pyramid. 16 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he that is sent greater than he who sent him. I want you to do like I've done to you. Now, you understand that in corporations, you have this pyramid system. It's not very complicated. You can picture a pyramid right now. And, and the CEO, the big guy, is at the top, and everybody else answers to him. Even the guys down at the bottom, you have this broad thing at the bottom, and you have the people who work in the mailroom, you have people who, who come in at night and clean the building, and you have all sorts of these people, entry-level jobs, and gradually you come up until, there he is right there at the top, he's the CEO. And what Jesus did was to flip it over, and it's shaped like this. And who would be great among you? It's okay with me if, if you say, I'd like to be the greatest member of the East Hill Church of Christ or whatever congregation of which I'd like to be the, the greatest member of the West Fayetteville Church of Christ. It's okay with me if you want to say that, provided that you, you do it the way that Jesus is teaching here. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. He flipped it over. You want to be great? Greatness in, in the teaching of Jesus is not in how many people I can get to serve me. If you do it the way Jesus teaches us, disciples, greatness is in how many people I can serve. I, I need to be aware of my brother's needs. And so you, you can't skip the point that Jesus noticed the need. I think he was looking for something. I think that he, he walked in there and, and he needed to teach them this lesson. And, and he knew that, that people learn better if they have an object lesson. They have some way to see it. And, and so can you just imagine that he walked in and he was thinking, how will I do this? And then there it is. He knows, he knows the answer. There wasn't anyone there to wash the feet. And, and I guess because that they arranged for the room and they have, they have an important reason to be there to observe the Passover, but this wasn't social, this was religious. It was about the Passover, and there wasn't anybody there to wash the feet. And, and so Jesus was looking for the need, and it was perfect. How, how can we call ourselves Christians if we don't consider ourselves servants? 1 John three seventeen. whoever has this world's goods and you, you, you have this world's goods? I suppose I do too. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's an attitude. It, it's about the inverted pyramid. And once you get this, once you grasp it, this mentality of Jesus who was down there washing their feet, this mentality of a Lord who described himself as being meek and lowly in heart, once you grasp that, and you see yourself through that, it changes everything. You'll start seeing things in Scripture you haven't noticed before relative to this. 1 Peter 5 and 3, elders, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. In other words, of course, the eldership is, has authority delegated by the Lord, and yet their spirit is one that is, is meek and in a way lowly not subjugation. 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth, but be an example of the believers. Gospel preacher. 
Timothy, you would be a gospel preacher. Let no man despise you, but be an example of the believers in word and conversation in charity, spirit and faith and purity. Matthew 20, 27, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here's the third lesson I want to draw. My service must not wait on others to join me. So I think, I think it's very interesting. And I don't really understand it. I guess they were just perplexed by what Jesus was doing. Peter, Peter felt free enough to say, no, you won't wash my feet. And so he, that was, there was that, and they were conversing during supper, and so there was a give and take. But when he starts washing their feet, how come, how come none of them said, here, Lord, help, let me help you with that? How come two or three of them didn't say, here, you, you do him and I'll do him, and let me help you with that? I think they just sat there sort of dumbfounded and watched him do it. It's a wonderful thing to be in a congregation and be involved in the work of the church and in programs that we do. I'm really in favor of that. I just don't want us to have the mindset that the service that I render, especially to the household of faith, has to wait for a group event. That would, that would not be like the Lord. Are you willing to serve the brethren even if it means serving alone? Are you? Jesus just got up and did it. He was, he was looking for an opportunity to make his point of service. He found it, and he just got up and did it. Number four, my service will sometimes involve receiving service for, from others. I don't know if this is applicable to you or not, but I think that that sometimes people, Christians, can have the, the spirit that somehow thwarts this. And there's a, there's a line in here. I, I've known of people that really were in the church because of what they could get. And the stream of blessing from being in the church always needed to be coming their way. And if it wasn't coming their way, buddy, they would let you know. I surely don't want to be that. It'd be contrary to all that I'm teaching today from John chapter 13. But there's another category of people and I think it's, the pendulum is all the way on the other extreme. And, and that is that I really, I really don't want anybody doing anything for me. I, I don't want you to know if I'm ill. I don't want you to know if I, if I need something because I, I I, I'm a private person. And I would suggest to you that, that Peter, and I, and I understand you have the facet of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, and so Peter had had this discomfort with Jesus serving him. But surely there's a category of people that would say, no, 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 no. I, I don't want you serving me. I won't have that. Well, you know what? It turns the whole thing on its ear, doesn't it? There's a balance in here. I, I, I didn't come into the church in order that people would serve me. I didn't come for what I could get, but what I could give, that's how we are. And that's what the lesson is for this day. But at the same time, if we, don't, if we don't let other people serve us when we're struggling, I think that we mess this whole thing up. So I would say to not to get into the Peter syndrome, back away from that. My service will sometimes involve receiving service from others. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for, thank you for helping me. I, I really appreciate that. I'm so glad that you're with Christ. Number five. My service would often be a costly exercise. In the case in, in John 13, when Jesus taught us this lesson, it was costly. And I, it, it almost takes my breath away because, well, well if you're the son of God, you put yourself in his shoes. And he has a brief few hours. He's under immense pressure because the cross is coming and because the betrayer is sitting right there. And he loves them to the end. And Peter's sitting there and Peter's going to deny him in just a, just a few hours. He's going to deny him. And all the pressure, the stress of the moment, and there's Jesus. And he, this is how he uses his time. He gets up and he washes their feet. And do you understand what I'm doing to you? And this is an example to you. I want you to wash one another's feet. He, he takes his time for this. It seems to me there's a lot of things. Can you think of things right now that Jesus might have done during that time, how he could have used those moments? He wasn't praying to the Father during this time. He's going to do that in a few minutes. When he goes down to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's going to be praying to the Father. He could have been praying now. That's not what he's doing. He could have taught them a whole collection 
of lessons. Okay, now remember, there, there are these things before I leave. You've got to know this and this and this, and, and yet here's the time. My point is that sometimes, and this is going to be true in your life and mine, sometimes service is going to be costly. You don't get involved in people's lives without, uh, without sometimes it costs you a lot. Time and effort and energy. And Number six, here's the last one. Serving the way Jesus taught me rewards me with happiness. Now, the last verse of, of the, the part I read is verse 17. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. The, the Greek word here is sometimes translated blessed and sometimes translated happy. And if you look up the Greek word, it seems to me that, that both definitions or both uh, uh, renderings are adequate to reflect the word. And that's because the kind of blessing that you get involves or includes happiness. It means, blessing means approved of God, and I understand that, but it also means the joy that is derived from that. It's really interesting to me to think about all the kinds of things that, that you just naturally feel because you're human, that God just wove into your DNA. Since I was in this pulpit last, Cindy and I have added a couple of grandchildren we have five. We are rich with grandchildren. Liza Jane is almost two. I'm sorry, almost one. She's almost one, and she's fat, and she's happy. And, and if, you, if you tease her and you make faces at Liza Jane, she will cackle. She has sort of a guttural kind of a laugh. And she'll, I just, it's just wonderful. She just laughs, laughs. Ha, 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 ha. She, she can't talk, but she can laugh. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Nobody, nobody taught her to do that. That's just part of her makeup. God put that, if you, if you give a baby a particular stimuli, they're going to respond in laughter. It's also true about crying. And so Caleb and Becca have a, a new baby, and his name is Ellis Glenn. I don't know why they bothered with the Ellis part. I said, I'm going to call him Glenn. And his mama said, no, we're going to call him Ellis. Okay. All right. But Ellis is a little baby. And, and Ellis, when, when he's hungry at 2 o'clock in the morning, he, he's, he, he has this cry that will wake you up. I don't, I don't reckon anybody taught him that. That's just something natural. That's something that God wove into a baby. He just knows how to do it. And you can think of a whole long list of these things, can't you? When a man becomes of age, he's going to seek a woman. He, he wants to marry a wife, and that's a very natural thing. And if Romans chapter 1, for example, if he doesn't pursue a woman, he pursues a man, that's against nature. Because natural is that God wove it. He didn't just jump up one day and think, you know what, I think I'll want me a woman. I think I'll want to get married. It wasn't like that. He didn't make that decision. God just wove that into his psyche. There are things that are very natural. Now add to that list, this one that Jesus is talking about here, in John chapter 13 and verse 17, which is that there, there's happiness attached to serving. You don't have to believe me. You just have to experiment with it. Do it. You, you say, I, COVID makes me a little depressed. Yeah? Yeah. There's other things right now that make me a little bit depressed. We, uh, we've got us in a, a, a political administration now that is opposed to Christianity in a way that I've never seen before. You a little depressed? Other things in your life, stressful, painful, difficult? Yeah, oh yeah. You may tell you what to do. Go and, go and serve others. You find somebody who needs you and you, you provide that. Don't wait for the church to get a group together. You don't, that's not necessary. Just go do it. And don't, don't be fretting about whether or not people know it. Sometimes you'll be able to do it. The most fun of all, the happiest you'll be is when you can do something nobody knows about it. You know, I mean, they don't know that it's you the, who did it. You just do it. Provide that. T take care of somebody. Right now, I'm talking to you, and you, you know what? In your mind right now, you can probably imagine, you can think of people who, who could use some help right now. Because we know a lot of people. You know people right now around you in the church who could use some help? Got some widow women who could use you? Got some teenagers who, who are struggling with something? And you could, they could probably use you. 
Can you think of people right now who could use your help? You want to be happy? I'm not saying that you should do it just because you want to be happy. I mean, because you, you, you do it because you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I, what I'm saying is that there's, there's a dividend that comes that Jesus is talking about here. And you know it because you've experienced it at some point, haven't you? You, you know this is true. Didn't you ever go to the hospital and visit somebody who is sick and give them some encouragement? And as you walk out, you take a deep breath of that free air and you think, I'm so blessed. I've got my health. I am so blessed. How many times have you experienced that? You know it's, a, you know it's true. It's a natural thing that God wove into your DNA and your psyche, which is that service produces happiness. I'm meek, I'm lowly in heart, he said. And, and then just before they, they crucified him, this precious few moments with his disciples there at the Passover, he interrupted supper. It wasn't about eating. It just didn't, it wasn't about that. He, he, he just, he needed to get this across to them. And he, he starts washing their feet and they don't understand why. They just sit there and watch him do it. And Peter pushes back and he says, no, I'm going to do this. Okay, okay, okay. And then he says, do you understand what I've done to you? They don't respond. According to the text, you don't have any response. I guess they just look at him. I'm your master, I'm your Lord. If I wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And if you do these things, happy are you if you do them. Thank you. God bless you.